Welcome back to another exciting episode of Primetime News. We've got a lot to go over this week, including the eBay winter seller update. But before we do that, I'm going to take you to a viral TikTok video that got a lot of people upset regarding how someone received their package in the mail from somebody selling on Poshmark. Let me show you the article. Then the video. All right, so this is the article by Distractify, and you see it says, woman shows how her Poshmark order came shipped in a clear Ziploc bag in viral video. So as we scroll down here, you'll see the video. Let me expand it so you could see what she said word for word. I love shopping secondhand online, D Depop, eBay, Poshmark, all that. But it's funny to me because these sellers are so full of surprises when they ship you your items. You never really know what to expect. Your item could come in a plain gallon Ziploc bag with the, the shipping label slapped on it. Without tape even, it could come. Just draw them. All right now it wasn't really raw dog because raw dog would mean that you put a shipping label on the actual item itself and mail that out without any protection whatsoever. So fortunately that didn't happen here, but regardless, it's still not a good idea to take any item, put it inside of a Ziploc bag, close it up, slap a shipping label on it, and then mail it off just like that. I'm going to explain in a few moments why that is a very bad idea. Now, I'll be very clear. I don't think there is anything wrong with taking an appropriate item, putting it inside of a Ziploc bag or any other type of food storage bag, as long as it's new, and putting that inside some professional packaging such as an air jacket like this or a poly mailer or a flat rate uh, padded envelope or a flat rate box or your regular standard cardboard box. Just don't put it inside of a cereal box or the dreaded cheese it box. How many of you have received items like this in the mail and how did it make you feel? Let me know that in the comments section. Now, about the only advantage I could think of to getting something like a, a book maybe inside of a cereal box or a food box is that if you're really hungry, you know, you could look deep down inside. And if you're lucky, there might be a couple pieces of cookie crisp. Or, you know, <laughs> if you're hungry, you could snack on that for a little bit. So that's good. But otherwise, most people I know of and I know because I've received messages from a lot of people have told me, could you believe how this person sent me this item? And even if they don't leave a negative feedback, they say, I'm never going to buy from this person again. Now, I'm all for recycling. I don't want to get this confused. I recycle stuff, but there's a time and a place. And I would argue that your business is not the time and place to recycle things like this. Recycle it in other ways. I'll give you another example. So. I like to use these air pillows. So I could use this and protect things very well with it, but I could also technically use Mountain Dew bottles and Mountain Dew cans, but I'm not going to, right? Because it's going to look unprofessional. That is a big thing. Now, I actually know that there have been instances of people using things like soda cans and garbage bags and just throwing all that stuff in as fill. Not a good idea. Think about it this way. There is no professional company or company for that matter that sends their items out to their customers in food storage boxes and in Ziploc bags. They just don't do it. The only place that you see this happening is on places like eBay and Poshmark and these other reselling platforms. And don't get me wrong, it's not always resellers who are doing this. Sometimes it's just people who, you know, don't have any experience reselling and they're just trying to sell something from around the house and they think that that's fine. Now, in addition to the professionalism problems here, there's also problems about security because in this instance, the person didn't even bother to seal the closure with tape. 
you cannot just assume that once you've closed the zip here, that it's not going to open again during transport. That could easily happen. Sometimes it won't, but other times that's what's going to happen to your item. Bye-bye. It's gone. It's opened up. See you later. That's obviously a big issue. And another security problem related to putting things in these kind of bags is that they're see-through. Now, even the ones that aren't clear, you could still usually make out what's in them, like the light blue ones, for example. You could still see what's inside. And once that happens, it increases the risk of theft. Someone sees it, says they want it, and they just take it. Another problem has to do with privacy. When you could see what's in the package, that's going to get a lot of buyers upset because they don't want the postal worker to know what they're buying. They don't want their nosy neighbor to know what they're buying. They don't even want their friends and family to know what they're getting in the mail. It's a private experience for a lot of people, and this violates that. So let me know in the comments what you think about this as a buyer and as a seller. Um, I'm sure there are some people who don't mind this and say, well, you know, as long as I get the item that I ordered, then I'm fine with it. And so some people will think that, and then there's going to be a bunch of people who can't stand it at all. All right, we're going to move on to the eBay winter selling update and then the regular recap of the weekly reselling news stories. But before I do that, if you enjoy the primetime news and want to support this broadcast, you could do that by becoming a channel member. Just click the join button here to see the different membership levels available. All right, here it is, the 2022 winter seller update. As we scroll down, you'll see that there are three different sections, running your business, listing and promoting, and then the part they tucked away on the bottom that they don't really want you to see, the fees and financials section. And I know a lot of people skip past that because I had people message me about it and tell me they didn't realize that there were going to be fee increases. They said, well, maybe I just zoom past that by accident. Well, actually you didn't get to it because it's at the bottom. So let's go over some of the issues here. All right, so let's start with the fees. As of March 1st, 2022, final value fees for store sellers will increase 0.3% in most categories. So for example, if you're selling something in the home and garden category, you're going to see an increase from 11.7% to 12% in that final value fee. If you are not a store seller, then you're going to see an increase of 0.35% in most categories. If you happen to use subtitles in your listings, which I rarely ever use, uh, then you're going to see a 50 cent increase in that. And something that has not gotten a lot of attention is that they are increasing the promoted listing standard fee. So what they used to base that on is the final sale price, but now they're going to include the taxes on the sale in that promoted listing charge. And they're also going to include any other applicable fees on the sale. So look for that to go up and consider that if you're using promoted listing standard. All right, so with regards to these fee increases, I'm not happy about them. No seller that I know is, but at the same time, I'm also not surprised because we're living in a time of significant inflation. Inflation was 7.5% in January alone, and that's at a level that hasn't been seen in about 40 years or so. We just had to deal with another round of USPS postage price increases. So while these increases are not huge. The problem is there's just so much you could keep taking away from sellers in all of these different areas before it starts to not become viable to either resell certain things or to resell on certain platforms. So what you really have to do is you're going to have to take a look at your numbers after all these increases take effect, and you're going to have to see where your profit margins are. Now, if your profit margins are not where you need them to be, you're going to have to find a way to make up this money that you're losing somehow. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to either have to start sourcing stuff for a lower price, or maybe you start buying things in bulk more compared to what you used to do, or maybe you start moving towards higher priced items that will give you a bigger profit margin. Maybe you start moving into different niches if the niche that you're in 
is not really viable anymore. Same thing goes for the platforms that you're selling on. What I see as a trend is that uh, sellers are moving more and more towards direct to consumer. That's why whatnot is so popular right now. It's going direct to consumer on the screen. Yes, whatnot is taking a fee, but it's more of a direct interaction with the buyer and people are wanting that more. Same thing with the YouTube auctions that are so popular or just YouTube buy it now events like that. Uh, Facebook sales. I think things like that are going to be more and more common and that's where the trend is. So uh, eBay and these other sites do need to be careful with these fee increases so that they don't run off too many of their sellers. All right, so in the running your business section, eBay has announced that they will be expanding their efforts to reduce unpaid items for accepted offers. This is something that many sellers have been complaining about for years, including myself, and asking eBay to step in and fix. So the way they're trying to fix this is by asking buyers to enter in their payment information before they make an offer. This way, when the offer is accepted, they have agreed to have their account charged and the seller sees that they've been paid. This is something that's supposed to be expanded to more and more buyers and also to counter offer situations and to best offer situations. Now, it sounds good on the surface, whether or not there are negative unintended consequences remain to be seen. So for example, will there be enough buyers that are upset about having to enter in their payment information that they just don't make offers at all and move on to different platforms. Time is going to tell on that. There also will probably need to be some fixes made for uh, buyers who want to combine multiple items together because right now you have to send one offer at a time and there could be some complicating issues there with regards to uh, combining shipping, if you do calculated shipping and that sort of stuff. So uh, this is the beginning of it though. Time will tell how it works and I'll keep you updated on it. Now eBay is making some changes with feedback. So if a buyer starts to leave a seller negative feedback, they are putting prompts on the screen to encourage the buyer to reach out to the seller first before leaving that negative feedback. Now, while that sounds great on the surface, the problem is that it doesn't seem to have any teeth to it. In other words, what's to stop the buyer from just ignoring the prompts and just leaving the negative feedback anyway? So that's why I've long argued that eBay needs to do a much better job protecting sellers who have good standing with the platform. And for those sellers, what I think they need to do is put a temporary block on the ability of buyers to leave sellers a negative feedback until they've shown that they've tried to reach out to the seller and resolve the situation. Then if it can't be resolved, there's the opportunity to leave a negative feedback. But at the same time, I know a lot of sellers agree with this, eBay should open up the opportunity for sellers to leave negative feedback for buyers. All right. Now there's another feedback change that I don't even think many sellers have been asking for, except maybe brand new sellers who are trying to get their feedback score up. But eBay is going to start reminding buyers to leave feedback for sellers. When are they going to send the reminder? Right around the estimated delivery time. And we know how accurate that is, right? So sometimes that's just way off. And the problem is, is that buyers might feel like they're getting badgered by eBay to leave these feedbacks. The item hasn't arrived yet. They might get annoyed and leave negative feedbacks in cases they otherwise would not have uh, if they weren't getting these reminders. That's why I never remind buyers to leave feedback. The best way to get buyers to leave feedback for you is to provide awesome customer service and get them the items that they actually ordered. All right, now there's some important fee credit updates, one of which I'm gonna give eBay a lot of credit for, no pun intended, but if you accept a buyer's cancellation request and provide the full refund, eBay is going to give you back the entire final value fee plus that 30 cent per order fee that they have been keeping all along since managed payments came into effect. So that's great. But you should know if you provide a partial refund to someone, they are going to keep that 30 cent per order transaction fee and they're going to automatically credit prorated portions uh, of various fees to your account. You also should know 
that if you go below standard, they are going to increase your final value fees from 5% to 6%. So you want to make sure you are keeping above standard. All right, now eBay has announced some improvements in the messaging experience of the app. If you've used the messaging in the app, you know that it is very outdated and it's pretty clunky to go through. So now it's gonna look more like a smartphone conversation experience, which looks like a definite improvement to me. So I'm excited to see that. It also looks like it's gonna be easier to organize conversations in the app. So that looks great. We'll see what happens. Now in the listing and promoting section, the main update is that as of March, 2022, they are getting rid of the Selling Manager Pro service. Uh, that was basically a program that people could pay to get some additional fancy features to use. The one that they had that most sellers seem to ask for over the years was the ability to automatically leave feedback to buyers. And now you're going to be able to do that without paying anything extra. So for example, if you want to automatically leave positive feedback for buyers after they've paid for the item, uh, you can now do that, set your preferences for that. Uh, you could also set it so that uh, you leave feedback once the buyer's paid for the item and left you positive feedback. You'll also be able to customize different types of feedback messages uh, that you would like to leave. All right, now another feature you will get is the ability to automatically relist your auction items through Seller Hub. So you can relist them continuously until the item sells or relist them continuously whether the item sells or not. All right, now you'll also have access to more reporting features in the Seller Hub Performance tab. You'll get access to sales data by eBay category and by format, that's for fixed price or auction. You'll be able to access sales data by seller store category. You'll be able to check your number of overall buyers and your number of repeat buyers. And you'll be able to search by listing title and item number. All right, so for promoted listings, I know not all of you use it, but for those of you who do, there are updates at each level. So for promoted listing standard, they put in this new campaign dashboard so you can manage the campaigns easier. I use that very selectively, so we'll have to see how much of an improvement that actually is. Uh, for Promoted Listings Express, I don't use that, but they are enhancing it so that you can manage it through the desktop as well as the app. And for Promoted Listings Advanced, which I also don't use, they're changing things so that uh, they're giving more control over when your listings do appear or don't appear depending on what keywords or phrases buyers enter when they do a search. All right, so we're moving on from the eBay winter seller update, but not away from eBay entirely because eBay acknowledged another major glitch. They accidentally sent some sellers in California a 1099K form that never should have been sent to them. So this caused a lot of sellers who received this some anxiety because they weren't sure if this form was also sent to the IRS, to the California tax board, or if they had to account for this in some way in their taxes. So eBay clarified it was a mistake, that it wouldn't happen again, uh, and also let them know that they won't get a 1099K form from them this year, uh, again, unless they made more than $20,000 in gross sales and made more than 200 transactions. I know if you thought that that was the end of the glitches, it's not because then we found out that eBay also accidentally sent 1099K forms out to buyers buyers who said that they never sold on the platform. And then we found out that they also sent 1099K forms to people who said that they never bought or sold on the platform, period. So I don't know how that happens. That's just really strange. I think that one of the things that could have happened with the sellers in California is that eBay may have jumped the gun and use the 2022 $600 threshold for 2021 and then realize the mistake, but how something like this happens, I have no idea. Sometimes you can't make this stuff up with these glitches. All right, now if you think that eBay is the only place where sellers are getting upset at the platform, it's not. There were a lot of Etsy sellers this week who were upset at the platform because they were sending out items on time, trying to get them out the same day or within one day, and then buyers were opening up return requests and Etsy was just granting it just flat out. So then the seller was out the item, plus they were out the money. That's not good, Etsy. You need to fix that ASP. 
to the AP. All right, so in this week's primetime crime series, we've got yet another person in a position of authority and trust who is alleged to have abused it and stolen items to sell online. In this case, we're dealing with the person who is the head of the Strozier Library at Florida State University, where there were thousands and thousands of comics that were stored for preservation. Uh, what this guy's alleged to have done is to have stolen 5,000 of the comics and to have uh, sold about $100,000 worth of them online. Uh, eventually what happens with this, and I could just tell you this as someone who's an official member of the comic book community in terms of selling and collecting, is that the word gets out on stolen goods. That's what happened here. Uh, there were owners of a comic shop who realized that this guy happened to have the exact types of comic books that were said to have been stolen from this uh, library. So they're like, what's the chances of that? They contacted law enforcement. And then this guy wound up uh, getting arrested and charged. So of the 5,000 comic books, they were able to recover about 3,000. Hopefully they're in the same condition uh, that they were when they were taken. And hopefully they could recover the other ones. All right, now not only are comic books in libraries not protected from people stealing them and trying to sell them somewhere, uh, the same thing is true for newspapers. At least in New York City, people are going onto people's driveways, taking them out of there, and then bringing them somewhere else to sell them. Notice that I said sell them, not resell them. This is one of the ways in which the media confuses things and gives reselling a bad name this is far different from what we do as a hobby and as a profession. These are people taking stolen merchandise and selling it, not reselling it. I'm going to keep pointing that out when that comes up. Uh, so what's happening here is that this is causing people who uh, make these papers to put stamps on them to let people know that the paper might be stolen depending where they got it from. All right. So this next article I debated putting up because I almost retched when I first saw it. I'm serious. I really almost puked. So if you do not have a strong stomach, move on fast forward to the next clip for sure. But I decided to put this up because I really think it is a good public service announcement to let people know that if you're going into thrift stores and you're buying things like couches and sofas and things with cushions, you have to look underneath before you get it. I'm getting the chills just thinking about what I'm going to show you here. So this sofa, uh, this person went in to get and she posted online that she couldn't believe what she found underneath it. So she even put up a big trigger warning that she found thousands of fingernails and toenails underneath and God knows what else was in there. But you'll see it in just a second. Again, here's the trigger warning. One, two, three. Don't look if you don't want to see this. All right. So here we go. Look at that right there. What kind of nails are those? That is so disgusting. I can't even get over it. I don't even know what the other stuff is in there. I'm not even totally looking at it. It's just so gross. I'm going to move it up. You get the point if you saw it, but please be sure to check out underneath those cushions or just don't get sofas from thrift stores at all. All right, now PayPal has been in the news this week because they announced they're dumping 4.5 million users off of the platform. And you'll notice there it says that they're copying eBay strategy. What that means is that eBay realized that they were not going to be able to reach the level of new customers, aka buyers, uh, that they had projected. And this didn't look good for shareholders. And PayPal realized the same thing. So what did eBay do? They decided to change the goalpost and say that instead of focusing on increasing the raw number of buyers, what they're going to focus on are what they call high value buyers. So people who buy things uh, at a certain amount of money or more each year, as opposed to someone who just spends like 20, 30, 40 bucks every now and then on the platform. PayPal said exactly the same thing. If you go down to the bottom of the article in the very last sentence, the uh, PayPal CFO says, we strongly believe that we are making the right decisions in redirecting our spend towards high value customer acquisition and engagement channels. As it says on the bottom, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. All right, now PayPal is also in the news this week for warning that consumer spending is about to fall sharply. Now, 
If that's true, that's obviously of significant concern to people like us who sell on e-commerce platforms. Uh, the problem for me is that I'm not sure how much of this prediction is actually based in problems with the economy, such as high inflation rates or uh, significant supply and demand problems versus problems with PayPal as a platform itself. You know, they've been cut off of eBay and that's a significant issue and they're facing more and more competition from other payment processors. So time will tell on this, but just be aware and uh, keep a lookout. All right, so now we're gonna go into our be on the lookout items. And we're gonna start with the type of item that everyone watching this has, which is pocket change that have pennies. And you yourself may have a penny that is worth one to $3,000. We're gonna go through each one of these. I'm gonna show you what to look for. All right, so the first one you're gonna look for is the 1914 D Lincoln cent. It has the D underneath the year. The D stands for Denver, which is where it was minted. Now there were only 1.2 million of the 1914 pennies minted in Denver. And there were 75 million minted in Philadelphia. So those would have a P on it. So that's what you want to look for. It's simply a supply and demand issue. This penny sold for $1,625 and it wasn't even graded. All right, now the next one you want to look for is the 1955 double die penny, also affectionately known as the double D. Now, if you find this one, it could sell for as high as $1,825. It's one of the most famous error coins around. The reason for it being called the double D is it looks like it has a double strike over the year, over the word liberty, and over the term in God we trust. The next one you want to look for is the 1909 Lincoln VDB penny. If you find this one, it could sell for up to $2,125. Now, the reason why it's called a VDB penny is because it stands for the initials Victor David Brenner. He's the guy who designed the first ever Lincoln penny. So you'll find those initials on the back bottom part of the penny. So this is the wheat side. You see those two strands of wheat on the side of the penny. That's why they also call this a wheat penny. So there were a lot of people who got upset when they saw that and they thought it was like a free form of advertising. So they just took his initials off of it entirely. So there's only about 484,000 of these pennies that have those VDB initials on them. The ones that don't, well, that's 72 million of them. So that's what makes it so rare and shoots that price up like that. All right, so the last one you want to look for is the 1922 Lincoln cent without a mint mark. If you find this one, it could sell for up to $3,000. The vast majority of these pennies have a mint mark that's a D for Denver. So pretty rare to find one without it. But if you do, you're in the money. All right, so another thing to be on the lookout for would be ugly shoes. This is something that has been trending lately. This Bloomberg Business Week article talks about the rise of the two and a half billion dollar ugly shoe empire. Uh, some of these are known as ugly core footwear. Now, the term ugly core has not really shown up in any significant degree in eBay searches, but look for it to be a term that you may want to use in the future as this trend continues to rise. Uh, what is going to be considered an ugly shoe to one person may be different to someone else. I'm sure there will be some more clear examples depending on the situation. But like this one here, like that shoe looks fine to me. Maybe that's because I live in Syracuse and wear the Syracuse orange. And uh, sometimes people wear orange shoes like that. I used to actually have a pair like that. Uh, but, you know, as you scroll down here, they give some examples uh, of several of these ugly shoes. Uh, some of them that sold for hundreds of dollars, including this Birkenstock uh, pair that sold for over $700. So just a trend to keep in mind. Another sports trend to keep in mind, just like last week, it's time sensitive uh, when we were talking about the retirement of Tom Brady and how his cards skyrocketed in value. Same thing with Joe Burrow. Searches for him in terms of cards have increased 708% as he has now emerged as the star and taking the Cincinnati Bengals to the Super Bowl. I would also generalize that to any other uh, Joe Burrow products, whatever you have, 
Look for it to go up in value, especially if they wind up winning the Super Bowl, if he wins the MVP. Same to be said for anyone who wins the MVP and whatever team wins the Super Bowl. Be fast pouncing on that. If you have any items related to the team or to a star player in the game, put that stuff up really quick because you want to strike when the iron is hot. And in our inspirational stories of the week, we're going to start with uh, this 35-year-old mom who it says here quit her job and the CNBC article, and she worked at her eBay side hustle full-time, and she made $141 million in sales last year. I know what you're thinking, right? You're thinking, wow, what the heck is she selling? Well, she's selling clothes, and then you're saying, wow, based on the article, she's making $141 million on eBay selling clothes? No, the article is misleading. What actually happened, and to put this in reference, okay, so this is Tori Gerbig. She is the CEO and founder of Pink Lily. So this is a clothing company. She did start on eBay. She invested $300 into a uh, bunch of clothing inventory that she got wholesale, and then she started branching her business out. But if you read the article, where things really started to blow up for her and her husband was when they went away from eBay and they started selling direct to consumer. So that goes full circle to what I was talking about earlier. All right, now the last story is very cool and inspirational. And this has to do with a group of quilters uh, who create these cool quilts in G Bend, Alabama. Now this is a very impoverished area. And these are African-American women who make these really cool quilts and they're very desirable. But the problem is since they live in an impoverished area, they didn't really have a way to bring their products directly to market in any type of large scale. So what was happening is that there were independent crafters who were making quilts that looked like this and calling them G brand inspired. So eventually they got sick and tired of this and they came together as a group and they eventually got some help approaching Etsy. And I give Etsy a lot of credit because what Etsy did is for a year, they took off the 5% uh, final value charge on the items. And they also gave them a $50,000 donation to help enhance things with listings and uh, do photographs and to bring their products to market. And as a result, their products have been sold out. Their business has exploded. And it's a really nice uh, story to see. So I hope they continue to do well and have lots and lots of success. So that's a wrap, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, give it a big thumbs up and I'll see you at the next one, everyone. Take care.